Hi everyone. Just getting set up. How are you all doing today? On this glorious Wednesday in September and December. What are we going to talk about today? Oh, I put the wrong date on here. Hold on. Let's get this corrected. Wasn't paying attention properly. Uh, uh, oh, that's a bit weird. I thought I just changed that. Um, we just correct that. A bit better. <clears throat> uh, I was just checking if I've missed anything else. I think that's the main things. Hope everyone is well. Is my audio okay? Let me know. Be really useful. Served, marvelous. <clears throat> right, let's do the news items first. I need a haircut too. Um Oh yes, so on the forum there was one interesting thread worth mentioning. Um, let me give you the link for that. And this was, uh, I think it's pronounced, oops, Bitter is the username. And he is uh, designing a frame buffer. Or well, he's trying to synthesize a frame buffer. Uh, let me check. I can't remember actually what board he's using. It's a nice on board, I think. But what does he say here? I'm assuming it's a black ISMX, but it's not 100% clear. Um, but he, he's suffering from that thing that so many of us do. Uh, and that is that when you um, start using memory, A, you've got to get the, get the, um, get Yosis to realize what it is that you're doing and that it needs to use BRAMs on certain occasions rather than registers. Otherwise it ends up using lots and lots of um, lookup tables. Um, and I think one of the big problems that Byter, Byter, it could be Byter actually, that he was having was because he was trying to concurrently access different areas, the combinational parts were exploding and it was trying to use all these LUTs rather than use proper uh, memory accesses, you know, the BRAMs. Um, but when he started breaking up, that those uh, lookup tables dropped. I think initially in his design, 
he was looking about 3,000 lookup tables. Um, towards the end of the thread, he's down to about 632, but he does it in a couple of stages. So it's quite an interesting lesson there. And also in terms of the frequency that he can run the code, you know, the timing analysis that uh, uh, next p and does in order to estimate how quickly you can run a piece of code. That improves significantly as well with a few tweaks. And he actually broke his memory accesses into several phases. Uh, the big suggestion came from David Shaw, uh, who pointed out, you know, that their memory was trying to be accessed concurrently rather than um, in different phases and in different sections, more importantly. So it could actually use different parts of the VRAM for different things. It's not just one store, but it can be broken up, particularly with the VRAMs. It's quite an interesting thread if you want to stay on top of those things. Um, The next one on this list um, oh yes this was on Twitter actually let me give you the link for this it's quite an interesting conversation um, team on um, it does something quite weird um, I don't know if you've seen the um, uh, here's the thread uh, the new Raspberry Pi module, um, let me just get you a link to that actually. Well, that's interesting. video here actually that talks about the uh, Raspberry Pi module but so um, lots of people have been designing um, carriers for this module uh, it's a much improved module over the previous generation the previous generation I think was the kind of dim if I remember rightly dim shaped with a gold connector at one end that fits in like a dim socket um, those are kind of okay but mechanically they're not brilliant um, and in the case of the Pi module, it's good to actually split out the connectors, I understand, because of what's on them. They can be separated so that certain things don't have to run quite as far as other things, whereas having them all on the same edge connector was difficult. But anyhow, so the, um, that module, uh, let me show you that whilst I'm at it. Uh, there we go. Let's turn my browser on. Should be able to see it. No. Uh, that's very odd. Hold on. This one. That's what it looks like. So, um, there you see it in one of the carriers. There, hold on. So, um, I think there's a, I think they already did, didn't they do a breakout? I think that's a close up of the breakout. There's the breakout there. Um, and what uh, Team One has done, so let me just bring up his uh, link. Bear with me a sec. Um, let's just get this up. 
open. So he's done this kind of Arduino shaped one, which is a slightly odd choice. But uh, it's actually quite cool. So the module sits there. But what's underneath that module is this. So you can see where the module sits and connects via these uh, high density surface mount connectors, high speed connectors. Uh, and he's got all the um, normal connectors broken out, things like the MNC or SD card, HDMI, uh, USB, uh, USB C and power. It's got a reset button, a couple of LEDs and stuff. And then on the back, uh, which was one of the things where I start the conversation, is an FPC connector, obviously, for I think that's for the camera. But um, and there's a high power USB as well. But he's also got this M2 connector on the back. Um, one of the questions he was asking, which is what brought this to my attention, was what would you do with the M2 connector on a Raspberry Pi? Was his question. I think most people chose. Um, I don't know if I can see this anymore. Uh, why don't we do the question? Hold on. There's some great little picks in here, actually. Lovely LEDs, look. Um, yeah, so saying what you put in the back. I think it, it, in the um, in the survey, I think what won out was most people wanted to use it for an SSD card. Of course, what I said I'd use it for is to put an FPGA dev board in. And then that started an entirely different conversation um, about that. Um, but there are some issues. Um, so what I link to, I wonder if I can find that, hold on. See if I can find the uh, conversation. And we're talking about what keys would be needed. So, yeah, there was the vote. As you can see, SSD won out, followed by a 4, 4G, 5G modem. Quite a few people are using the uh, Google Coral TPU accelerator, presumably for me machine learning. Other, which is what I clicked. FPGA dev board. Um, but, yeah, he was talking here about uh, what keying he'd do, because the one we're looking at here isn't necessarily the one he's going to ship. So it might have a different keying, but he's talking about using an M plus a B key or accepting M plus B keys, um, which is interesting. There's only one PCIe lane, but that would work. I, I figured it would still work quite nicely with an ECP5. So you, on your PCI board, you could have an ECP5 with some DDR memory. And um, it will be a bit like, hold on, because people have done this with Xilinx. Uh, uh, did I link to that? I'm sure I gave a link. Uh, damn it. Um, uh, it was on crowd supply. Hold on, crowd supply. Yeah, Night Fury is the latest one, but it was one earlier than this. So this was an RTX 7 
DCIE, and that's an M keyed car. Actually, the price on that looks quite good. I don't think you can get this now, though. although it's listed here. It talks about $99, which is actually quite a bargain for that. Um, but there was one before this that was smaller, but it wasn't uh, an M key. I think it was a A and E key, the previous generation of this. I don't know if they're linked to um, the original one. Because this was done, what, last year, I think. Pico EVB. Is that what it was called, maybe? Bear with me, folks. Just catching back up. Yeah. So here you can see the two together. So this was the first one they did. And that was just an Arctic 7. It didn't have any DDR memory on it. Whereas the new one does. It was also a lot more expensive, the first one, compared to this one. And as you can see, it was multiple keys. Um, so something like that for the ECB5. Because it would just be kind of cool to have the combination of the Raspberry Pi and an ECB5, in my opinion. Um, right, I'm missing what Laurie's saying here. He's chuffed that uh, his Mac Plus implementation started working today, so I'm going to have a look at that in a minute. Um, it's written in Verilog and Michael Python. And that's the code. All right, let's let's right, we'll we'll have a look at that in a sec. Have I covered my other points on this? Um but anyhow, we'll watch what Timon is gonna do. Actually, the reason that Timon did this is a bit odd because um it was partly down to what Tanner Scott said. Scott, who's the um, uh, MicroPython lead, has been talking for a while about using Raspberry Pis, not with Linux, but just running native MicroPython, i.e. bare-bones MicroPython. <laughs> so it should run really, really quick, as you can imagine. It's quite an interesting thing. So one of the reasons that this was put together by Timon was to do that. To create that format and see what it's like so it's much more like a microcontroller and in, in that way you're plugging into a host a micro python host albeit a rather super powered one which is kind of fun so that's an interesting one to watch um and i like the uh, running sorry the circuit python not micro python on uh raspberry pi is an interesting idea bare bones so that's news. We need to keep an eye on that. And then the next one I was going to talk about when I'm thinking of doing for streaming next year. Well, I can cover that in a minute. Let's have a look at what um, what we've got from uh, Laurie here today. Oh, it's a screen capture of the Mac Plus running. That's so cool. I remember using Mac Plus. Oh, man, I was well into Macs then. Um, I used the Mac 128 as well, and the SE, and all of them really, through the years. I used to have to, I wrote software, I used to fix them, I was well into it. These, are, That's really cool. So that's, what's that running on? Is that running on the ECP5, um, Laurie? I remember Mac right. There was a really cool WordPress. I can't remember what it's called. It wasn't the um, I mean originally at that point in time, you know, uh, the word processors were much better than those on the uh, DOS competitors. It was a really good one. I can't remember what it's called. It was just called Write or something like that. Not Mac Write. Maybe it was New Write or something. Um, yeah, ECP5, 85F. Did you need the 85F for all the memory? I'm just checking if it runs on a 45F. So what a hundred yeah, 128K, because it says 127 available. Does that exclude the ROM? I oh, mind you, are you using the SD card as a disk? It's very, very cool. Damn, I remember that. Now, which system was that? 
that was that must have been like system two or three one of the early versions nice um so we look at this code that is so cool so urlx 3s underscore mac128 this is the verilog it's based around the 68000 wasn't it i'm presuming um Init file Mac ROMs speed of the clock to only 25 meg. Um, hmm. Using the SD RAM. HDMI VGA CPU. How much RAM do you get on the ULX3? I can't remember. Using the external SD RAM or using the internal SD RAM for this? On the 45, you get, uh, all right, yeah, 32 megabytes of external SD RAM. Right? Okay. So you're using that, or are you just using the internal resources? Um, so just yes, so just checking it runs on the full app. Uses four megabyte of SD RAM. That's a lot. Why does it use so much? Yeah, it uses ESP32 flash or SD card for the disk images. ROMs in BRAM, yeah, 128k. Track buffer is BRAM, 24 kilobyte. You're gonna have to help me out. Track buffer. Is that a bit like a cache, but not a cache? Uses FX68K CPU converted from system Verilog to Verilog. Where did it come from? The 68K um, Verilog. Usually 32 megabytes. Extend for 4 megabyte RAM. That is what a full Mac Plus uses. Is it? I can't remember, you know. Fetch the track of the floppy disk at a time from the ESP32. I don't know what a track means. As in, I, I know what it used to mean. So it still fetches by track, does it? Well, I expect the code does. I see. It's cool. You won't pass through to the ESP32. Hmm. Nice work. Looks cool. Wow, that's a chunk interrupt requests hmm overlay wow Nice work, Laurie. It's very cool.
Uh, when the ROM does a step of the track, the motor, it sends a request to the ESP32. Floppy disk is controlled by the integrated WAS machine. That's what this is, right? <clears throat> the integrated WAS machine. So was learning about the step is useful then. <laughs> I don't expect their steppers work quite the same as ours. Our examples. <sighs> cool man. Nice. Oh, run sixty-eight CPU slow. Does fit on the forty five F, that's cool. Yeah. That's nice, Laurie, I like it. It's very cool. I have to get it running when we get the uh ECP five done. Uh we'll have to change the memory thing because we got DDR two, obviously. Um and pins and stuff, but the rest of it will probably run. What, what, which, which ESP do they use? They use an ESP32. Is it of room or is it, um, the, the rover? Okay, so this is a CPU. Isure, who's Isure? Cycle accurate system, very lot cool. Did you have to change much? A lot of the system very lot is supported. Oh, cool. Nice one. I like it. I had to convert to Verilog. Yeah, but the Yosis does support some System 5 Verilog stuff. Not, not the entire lot, but yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Tea time. Hmm. There's just one bug converting it to very long. Well, wow, that's good. Excellent. Marvellous. Well done, mate. That's good. I'll, I'll have a play around with that when I get um, get the board up. It would probably be quite a good memory test. Uh, where else were we on our list? Um... I was meant to get more done on the um, black stack six layer ECB5 board. Uh, I got some done. I didn't get it all done, which is unfortunate. But I got reminded, I got visited by my accountant who was just passing through last week. He knocked on my door to say hello and said, don't forget to get your accounts done. 
um, because even though you're meant to, um, they've given an extra three months or something because of COVID in the UK, this is, but the tax is still due at the same time, which is end of December, I think. And you can't do the tax unless you know your, what your accounts were. So it's kind of stupid, really. But anyhow, so I, I always get it done this time of year. So I spent flipping days just getting everything up to date like you do. Gathering together the right paperwork, etc., etc. This is for the business stuff, not for not for the my storm, but um, my personal stuff. So that's been a lovely pain in the ass because I hate all that admin. Worst thing about running your own business is the admin, unless you happen to like that stuff, right? So, yeah, I lost a lot of time. Haven't been able to spend it on what I wanted to spend it on, which was getting that board finished. So I missed the deadline. So that's going to slip now, uh, especially with Christmas coming up. But anyhow, I continue to work on that. Um, what I've started thinking about now is what I want to be doing about streaming. Do I want to continue streaming? Uh, the answer I've decided is yes I most definitely do um, but if I'm going to try and get more people involved in it then I need to probably just think about things a bit more prep a bit more have some better story or stories um, because it has meandered somewhat, but that's that's fine. Because it was just it was experimental to start with. So in the new year, I want to kind of kick off in a new, uh, in a slightly new vein. Um, so if you've got any feedback on that, do let me know. Anything that you want to see covered, etc. Any changes you want to make to the stream format or anything like that, please let me know. Um, and the other thing is, I seem to have spent a lot of time uh, working on various stuff, but I just haven't been having as much fun recently. You know, part of that may be COVID, but I need to work on some of the fun stuff, some of the stuff that I've wanted to do for ages. So I'm going to combine that with the stream um, for 2021. So I think one of the big themes will likely to be um, not necessarily my storm, um, but I will be using my storm products. Uh, and I will most definitely be using MicroPython, maybe some CircuitPython as well. I will definitely be using FPGAs. Um, and in particular, what I want to focus on is some um, um, robotics projects. Um, and the separation of the various parts of that works really well with the uh, the newer MyStorm stuff. <sighs> so it will be orchestration at the uh, MicroPython level and the uh, low-level stuff happening in the FPGA, similar to what we've been doing with the stepper, really, but just um, slightly more organised, more of an event system. Um, I've been thinking quite a lot about how we deal with the intercommunication between the two, two pieces uh, and how we make that really work. Um, and there's some interesting conversations to be had around that. But definitely building motors. And also in the process, perhaps, um, so I mean, I've been working on robotic stuff for many years, at all sorts of different levels. Um, perhaps go through, obviously, some of the basic fund fundamentals. So build on things like the stepper and talk about motors and how we drive those and show you how how you can drive different types of motors in different ways and what the requirements are 
um, writing the HDL parts of that, as well as the kind of control parts, adding in the real time element that you don't have so much with an open uh, open loop control, such as a step up with the closed loop controls of robotics. Excuse me, let the cat out. Because on the closed loop side, things become a bit different. Um, one of the um, let me just change my view here actually. One of the issues you you have um, with something that's closed loop is you really need to be joined up systematically between the orchestration and the um, and the control uh, elements. And some of those are concurrent, obviously. But you also probably need a third part. So what I will envisage that we'll get to at some point in 2021 when we're putting together some of these robotic solutions is that we will need three major components. Probably a top-level communication stroke orchestration, which will definitely be MicroPython. Then maybe a secondary, which may be a combination of C and possibly MicroPython, and certainly connections into MicroPython. And then obviously the HDL stuff, again in NMIGEN, and those three things communicating together. Um, we need event systems and other sorts of things to make sure that all coordinates. Uh, the reason for having the additional part is for doing things like the more specialized part so for example later on once we get past the normal uh, control mechanicals and uh, basic orchestration we need to add in things like guidance and stuff so we're going to need to do things like um, some vision stuff basically uh, and the vision stuff alone takes a lot of resources. So um, that's where that third part comes in, really, a kind of specialised part. Um, but all of the hardware we need will be on um, the new next stack, if you like, the uh, amalgam board. So we'll be able to use that to do all of this stuff. It's not a problem. Sorry, let me just check my messages. What are you saying, guys? Mythical Duck. I've only just started watching. Don't really have any feedback. <laughs> just trying to get into a bit of VHDL and FPGA. FPGA. Uh, Louis says VHDL is not that easy. The open source talk. There is there is work being done on VHDL support. Um, I don't use VHDL, so I'm not not been following that. But there is work being done to enable that. Um, to be fair, the only board I currently have is a Nexus 4DDR. What's that? Let me just look that up. I'm just going to look it up if you don't mind. Uh, mythical Duck. Most of what we do is either Verilog or MMIGEN at the moment. I'll explain what those are briefly. Nexus TDR. So it's from Digilent. Is it? Is it a Digilent board? So it's an RTX7. Nice board. Powerful. Um, RTX7. I mean, we tend to use the open source tools. Yosis um, for Verilog. It's also underneath for NMIGEN as well. Um, there will be support coming for the uh, Vertex range. Um, there's a project called Project X-Ray, which is building in the support for that. I haven't looked at it recently to see what the status is, but it, it is evolving. There's a nice board, 227 pounds from far now. Not cheap, is it? There's lots on it though. 
looks very cool. That's this one, right? Nexus 4 DDR. So it looks like it's got a VGA connector, or is that serial connector? Ethernet, USB, it's got about four PMOD ports, five P, double PMODs, a whole bunch of switches, and some seven sex. Nice. They make good boards, Digilent. So, uh, yeah, so just so that you know, I don't know how new you are to FPGAs, uh, but there are two main RTL like languages. Verilog is one, VHDL is the other, um, both of which are used extensively in industry. Some are used in some countries more than others. Um, and then the other one I mentioned is nmigen, which is basically so you actually write your uh, HDL description actually in Python. That then uses Yosis underneath, which builds the intermediate library, uh, which can then be exported as Verilog, or it can build the HDL directly using things like Next PNR, play some roots in the open source tools. We tend to use the open source tools rather than the commercial tools. Um, and I think as Laurie says, there is a GHDL uh, Yosis plugin that enables you to use GHDL, but I don't know how well that is supported in the open source tools or whether it, you get a bit obscured because it's doing a kind of VHDL to, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Verilog conversion or not. Because I think um, when Claire wrote the Yosis tool, Verilog was the end game that uh, she was imagining. So that makes it slightly different from a VHDL point of view. But you're welcome. Hope you get something from it. You can always learn Verilog as well or uh, MMIGEN. Yeah, there is a lot of switches on that board. Dave Shaw got SNES running on the Eurolex 3 using GHDL. Well, oh, cool. That's good. So, yeah. So, one of the things that I'm thinking then, so for next year, is, um, I mean, there's a lot to cover in robotics. Um, Mr. Cool Duck saying it'd be nice to try and get an open source tool chain. I got me the Turbo Chameleon 64 too. I don't know that. Uh, and they had some VHDL source and Megas use VHDL, which is kind of like uh, I don't know what platform you're on, but there is a um, an easier way to build the. Um, FPGA stuff is it FPGA toolkit? Hmm. I don't know if it includes GHDL though. Um, Hold on, let me have a quick look on um, uh, do, do, do. disable streamer mode. Thank you. Let me just have a quick look on um, discourse because there is a forum channel for this, I think. Hold on. But it's an easy way of getting most of the tools on your system rather than having to individually um, download them. Hold on. Where did it open tool forge? No. Mm. 
maybe. I recognise it if I see it. Open Tool Forge, yeah. FPGA tool chain. So this might be a useful place to to start for the software um mythical duck. Um, and they talk about so that's this one here they talk about um, multi-platform nightfall builds so they're include yeah so they're including Yosis they've got the GHDL Yosis plugin and the GHDL command line tool some of this stuff is for the uh, sol solving uh, solution stuff so don't necessarily need it all but I mean I think it's all included installation I'm trying to remember they, they definitely support Mac and Linux I think they support Windows as well yes they do and you can either do use WSL Windows subsystem for Linux I wonder if you can use it directly as well what platform are you on mythical Either way, that's a good place to start because all the tools were in one place. So, yeah, anyhow, you'll find what you need there. If you need support on any of the tools, I mean, there's obviously lots of different channels. Um, that one is supported down at Open Tool Forge, which you find on Discourse. which is under um, one bit squared which is Esden's um, Peter's um, <laughs> channels uh, can I get a URL for that that's interesting so if I get this open tool forge invite notification invite people yeah so the the discourse uh, invitation if anyone wants to join the relevant channel for those tools on discourse is that which might be useful to you you'll find there's quite a few knowledgeable people down there just getting rid of some spammers right so yeah so next year then um, I want to focus on robotic stuff I have loads of stuff here, loads of kit as well that I can use. I've got um, this kind of make a Kamano, um, Meccano type stuff, which is kind of cool. But I hate the driver on it. So that's all coming off, and I'll replace that with, um, you know, with the uh, black stack. I've got loads and loads of stuff to play with. And I've got boxes of motors and things. I'll tell you what I got recently that's very interesting that I haven't played with in the past is um, is these McCarnum wheels. Anyone seen those before? They're great. So basically, there's four of them. And you can drive them with four small motors. In this case, uh, these are very small just use four of these uh, they're all brushed motors 
um, but they're geared in this case. But with four of those, and you can literally travel in any direction. They're brilliant. That's, yeah, mythical. Uh, Pimeroni is, that, is that exactly where I got these from. Uh, they had them on offer, actually, last... Uh, oh, I think it was in the... Um, one of their... Um, uh, what do you call it? Black Friday sales or something, which is kind of cool. I'm not sure if those fit with the projects I was planning on doing, but let's see. One of the project I, I mean, something for you guys to think about, okay? This isn't in concrete yet, but I mean, there's a lot of things to cover in the robotics uh, area in terms of the disciplines and stuff and how you should design things and the layers and things which I'll also be translating into on free island type uh, hardware. But um, one of the ideas I had is to actually make it useful. Um, is giving it a purpose. Uh, and this is actually quite difficult because a, a lot of the purposes people immediately come up with are super difficult you know they don't realize quite how hard it is to get something as stupid uh, as a robot to do something useful so one of the things i thought that might be quite good as a task for for one of the first robots is um there are different parts to it so for example, before we even get to its task, you know, the basic things that we have to get it to do is survival type techniques, uh, low level survival layer, which does things like gets it back to its charging station and that kind of stuff and gets itself unstuck. Um, so you've got all of that first survival type stuff. But, yeah, a wheeled sort of robot or tracked, maybe, I don't know. But uh, I think the goal will be, in, what, what I thought was a really good idea is, we'll have it, if we can, if I can work out a good way of doing it, we'll have it pick up Lego. So after you've had, say, been playing with Lego, particularly if you've been playing with the kids, you end up with just this mess pile of Lego on the floor. So what you could do is have this robot go out and just fetch all the Lego um and i think that can be done uh quite well there's all sorts of different tactics we can use for it to do that and there's all sorts of clever things we can add on top so for example rather than it just collecting it and dumping it in a certain area or in a bucket or something, we could actually build in something that recognizes the different pieces and then puts them in sorts them sorts of bricks and stuff in different ways uh, so you could have it sort by colour or, you know, there's all sorts of cool like image things that you can, you can do as well. So, um, I don't know what people think of that idea, but it, within there, you can cover certainly all the base disciplines. Um, and you could do it fairly economically as well. Um, and there's all sorts of fun trying to think of the strategies of how, this thing either picks up, collects, moves, shifts, shovels, whatever it does, how it's going to clear up the Lego. I mean, it has to identify what is Lego because you don't want it just picking anything up necessarily. You do want it to pick up the Lego and other things and stuff. So there's some interesting challenges in there. Um, and we won't get to that bit until well into 2021 because uh, we have to do all the base survival stuff as well as the education on the motors and you know, survival and all that kind of stuff first. But um, I don't know what you think of the idea, but anyhow, I'd love to do that because I haven't done any robot stuff for ages, apart from the commercial stuff, obviously. Um, so I think that's quite a good idea. But if you have any other ideas that you think are worth pursuing um, in that area, then let me know, because I'm always interested in ideas. Or if you think of any ideas of how we should do this 
strategies that we should use, hardware that you want to see used, that kind of thing. Again, let me know. Um, and I will, you know, start thinking about what we're going to need in order to do it. And I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do it, but I'd like to get other people that are involved in the stream involved in putting the robots together as well. So I have to kind of try and find a way of formalizing the robot builds in such a way that, you know, I can put the various bits of kits together, at least in stages and things, so that people can have the same mechanical pieces as well as the electronics in order to um, not just follow along, but actually participate in it as well and try different things themselves. Laurie saying, I haven't built robots for about two years since I started working on FPGAs. So where well, the FPGAs are taking you off your interesting subject, just like they have with me. But, uh, there you go. Um, this is the base I use for my MyStorm driven robot. Let's have a look at that. Cool. So that's a tracked motor. Uh, that motor there, that looks familiar. That looks a bit like the motors I have that came with the maker block stuff. Does that have a position encoder as well in it, Laurie? It's not just a motor. It has, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's the same. It looks very similar. Hold on, I'm just running my um, clothes over. If you look on the base of this, You've got, they look very similar. And those have the encoder built in as well. I probably won't use these ones for our robot because I think these are quite expensive. I don't know. And I'm not sure about the gearing and stuff, but we'll see. That's something we've got to work out. And I've done all sorts of things in the past, such as laser cutting. So this was like a late basic laser cut base for uh you know those stepper motors we've been working on driving where well, those fit in here very very basic this was like a really low cost thing i did for a bunch of makers uh, for our local maker space for uh learning how to do robotics type of event it will be a lot more sophisticated than this because that's um a using those steppers um is not appropriate in this cast but more importantly um is open loop. Um, we we'll probably use, I mean, I'd love to use brushless motors, but that's just too much to start with. Maybe we can advance to those later. So we do some brushed motors um, for this. Um, there was something else I was going to cover that I forgot to put in the community news. Oh, well, too late now. But um, as an alternative, we can do uh, your kind of bio-inspired bio robots as well. Maybe do that on the next level. I don't know. See what you think. Bio-inspired robots, you know, don't tend to have wheels. They have legs. So it might be a hexapod or something like that. Trouble is, with those, is they're fun to build. And the operation is really interesting particularly when you start operating the, um, uh, what do you call it? The, um, hmm, I've lost a word. When you start dealing with the way that the movement works, you use cyclic patterns to generate the leg movements and things. So the locomotion, a lot of the locomotion can, can be done quite easily in the FPGA itself, which takes quite a lot of load off the, um, off the processor. You really don't want to be doing that when you're dealing with the bio-inspired stuff because it's, the load is even higher than motors, regular motors, you know, wheeled type motors. So, I mean, we could cover some of that as well uh, as possibility. 
Um, using legged type robots to do the clearing up of Lego, however, would make it probably more complicated than it needs to be. So I think the kind of bio inspired stuff we should do as a separate thread or a separate project, perhaps. But again, let me know your thoughts on that. So what else? Let me just check this. Um, Riff Gordak says, I'm planning on trying to build me a custom 8-bit computer, custom CPU and GPU. That said, I'm quite happy to watch anything to learn. Well, it's not a bad place here. Uh, Laurie's not a bad person to talk to as well. Um, you can also join us down at the forum. I better give you um, our forum address, actually. Um, in fact, that link I put there earlier will be helpful. But let me just get this off. Hold on. Um, because this stemmed out of the microstorm. Sorry, microstorm. Oh my god, my storm. <laughs> My storm is FPGA boards, open source hardware FPGA boards that myself and Ken started back in 2015. Um, so that's where we know, or some of the people you'll see on here will, will probably have known about this. That's the only place I've really publicized these uh, streams is on that forum. Next year, I'll publicize them elsewhere and we're going to wider mix. Um, so if you want to uh, have any discussions on that front, um that's not a bad place to go and there is loads of things like retro cpus and stuff on there you know laurie's done a lot of that work which may be interesting to you um quadrature encoders yes i found your page through tindy says mythical there it says your Black Ice MX is out of stock. Yes, sorry, it is out of stock again. I've run out of boards, but I do have or will have some more soon. But I'm working on a new carrier for that. And I was going to wait until I got those carriers before I put them back in stock because the new carrier is better, frankly, particularly for this sort of work because it will support the tile boards, which is a way of stacking up the control boards, including power um which is better for things like robotics and control wrote a chat for this book on lego robots oh, damn it it's open the wrong browser wait a minute always does this Intelligence Unleashed, creating Lego NXT robots with Java. Cool. Nice one. A good friend of mine used to do a lot of Lego stuff. In fact, he used to build machines that helped him in his business. Um, manufacturing business. User friendly instructions on iOS MGX. NXT, yeah, uh, it's kind of cool. It's only eleven dollars that, but it's great. It's a bargain. Walking robots, all right, yeah, like that. Monte Carlo localization. Mm. Okay, so when it comes to working out where we're going, we should be badgering you, Laurie. I tend to use things like flow and stuff, but 
Um, there's all sorts of strategies you can use. Cool. Uh, what was next? What was next? <coughs> One thing to think about, by the way, is whether we actually pick up the Lego blocks or not, or whether we just shovel them. The trouble is with shoveling them, it's very difficult. It becomes like herding sheep, and you just lose stuff en route if you're not careful. Not only that makes uh, navigating obstructions and things more difficult, um, but picking them up one by one is probably not the most successful way of doing it. But there's all kind of things that we could do to make it more efficient. I'm going to have a quick look. I wonder if it gives the, you a... Um, does this one give you the... Um, doesn't give you the internal uh, preview. That looks cool. I'm looking forward to that. Laurie. The light's really strange today. It's probably because I haven't got the uh, lamp on. Get a bit more of the warm light on. That is too bright. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Right, where were we? Where is our list? Oh, yeah. So uh, I was thinking what board would we need first for that? Um, so let me open up that. I've, I've literally just started this one today, so it's, I'm nowhere near um, anywhere on here. But uh, why is that not running? Come on, wait, wait. So I'm working on the. I can I can control six different uh, motors on this. So hold on, let me let me work this out. Okay, let me get rid of the browser for a second. Let's bring forward. Let's turn off the editor. Let's turn on the cat. So um, this is a very simple layout of the um, tile for driving the uh, I'm just trying to squeeze in six motors and i was having trouble finding the right kind of connectors one of the things that i wanted to have on this uh, which is why it's so basic at the moment is um i want it all to be surface mount for example um this is a very simple um way of driving the board so if you remember with the tile interface, um, let me bring up schematic. Uh, 
Uh, I'll bring that to the front, maybe. Oh, show me the CAD. Okay. So if we look at the schematic for this, let me get it up so I can actually see what I'm editing here. Um, the each uh, the tile connection, um, which is this, I effectively have from F zero up to F eleven, uh, which are general purpose. IOs from the FPGA. So I've got 12 general purpose uh, IOs because the 12, 13, 14, and 15 are, are effectively SPI and select. Then I've got four analogs. I've got an interrupt pin as well. And then I've got um, the I squared C, SCL, and SDA. So each one of these motor driver boards, I used these ages ago. I love these chips. These are really rather good chips. They are ridiculously expensive, in my opinion, for what they are. But they are so unbelievably simple that... Um, I can't resist using them and I have used them before. So let me bring up the data sheet and you'll see what's in these chips. It's um, and it's four nine five zero. Let me just bring that up. Let's so let, let let me show you what that is. That Damn it, bear with me a sec. I'm just trying to move the um, windows around because this isn't very clear. And it's not letting me for some reason. Grab the damn window. Here we go. Okay. Let's just zoom in a bit. Maybe that'll make it clearer. Um, so they're very simple from the point of view uh, of driving. They don't try and do too much. Many of the drivers, uh, driver chips that you see, try to be too much to too many different tasks or functions. These are, they, th these literally extract a very simple, relatively simple but important function of coil driving for the motors. So um, these aren't chips that are trying to be a stepper motor that also does um, um, brushed motor driving. And these aren't brushless motor drivers that are trying to drive brushed motors. Because that's normally quite often the way people go is they use one or the other of those. And then the secondary function is they use them to do brush motors. These are just really good when it comes to brush motors. One of the really good things about them is they're actually capable of driving up to 3.5 amps and 40, vo 40 volts without adding any additional MOSFETs and things. That's one of the things that I really love about these. Um, and for most of the things that we're going to be using, that is more than enough. We've got plenty of headroom there. Um, also, the construction of a package is nice because they've got, um, you know, the um, thermal pad 
on the bottom as well, which is kind of good. So they're very simple in terms of the number of pins in and out they've got. Um, so if you look at the block diagram here, you've got two inputs. That is all you need to do the motor control. Um, there is an additional input, which is the VREF, which is really what you what you use to set the current limit. And it's a good idea to set the current limit because these things are capable of driving a lot of current in. You know, particularly if you look at those little motors I have, you know, the stall current on one of those is, you know, 800 milliamps or something. Uh, so you don't want to be trying to push 3.5 amps into them because um, they're going to get warm and then you're going to see a lot of smoke, basically. Um, and it's going to cost you a lot in motors. So having the current limit is a really nice feature. And again, that doesn't exist in many of these. Um, um, didn't think so. We need to choose a range there and we can drive that. We can either drive that with DAX or the other idea is to use the uh, ADC pins. I know that sounds backwards, but I'll come back to me. But what we can do possibly there is do, you know, like they do on the Arduino, PWM output, put a filter on it and then uh, use that uh, to set a voltage. But I'm not totally enamored by going that route because uh, it's not hugely accurate when you want a DC voltage on your VREF to accurately set your current limit. It might be good enough, might not. I think more likely I'm probably just going to be putting a, um, a DAC on the board that we can access via SBI or something similar. Or I squared C. Depends how quickly you want to change it because you can do some dynamic stuff as well if you've got a good DAC on there. So really the, the two main controls are two bits. So for each motor, we need two general purpose outputs to control this. And from those two bits, we can have the motor operate in a number of different ways. That's what's so clever about these particular chips. Um, they have all the useful safety features in as well, such as overcurrent, under voltage, etc., etc., etc. They also step up and drive the MOSFETs internally, so you don't have to worry about any of that. And they work from 8 volts all the way up to 40 volts. So it's a good range. And they have, you know, they will accept 3 volt type digital signals on the inputs. Um, the ADC ref we could easily use between 0 and 0, 3 volt free as well. So that fits quite nicely. Um, so we add a current sense resistor, which is this one for the current limit. And that will probably be a bit... 100 milliohms, something like that. So that's not going to take too much current, or there's not going to be too much current loss in that as well. That's 0.1 of an ohm. Okay, and then you've got two outputs, one for each end of the coil. It's really simple, and then you have to do your load supply. So it needs to be lots of capacitors, and you need different types of capacitors as well. You need some high speed stuff and some low speed reservoir capacitors, but I'll go through that. Here's the clever bit. Using those two inputs, we can change the way that we control how this works. So here you see some waveform examples of what you're inputting. Now, normally when you're controlling a motor digitally, you use a PWM, a duty cycle, to control how much energy you're putting into the motor coils. Obviously, the more energy that you put in, i.e. the greater the duty cycle, the more time on than off, normally, uh, the faster the motor's gonna turn. Okay. So in this case, because we've got two PWM inputs, we can change what we're asking it to do. Okay. In terms of direction, obviously, because we need directional control, and in terms of what's called decay. Um, I won't go into all the details of that because that would just spoil things for when we get to that part, uh, probably in the new year. But the point I'm making here is all of those things are available to us with just two pins, and it also includes braking support. So there's two things that you can do when you're not driving a motor 
to move in a certain direction. You can let it free will or you can break, which means you actively start reversing the magnetic field or absorbing the energy from the back EMF to slow it down more quickly. So it's got that, that, that support built in as well. So you can just see from this diagram the various different modes that it supports, which is kind of cool. And that's just in this really simple chip. And I love them. Uh, last time I used these, I was driving them with some XMOS multi-core processors. Uh, I can't remember what I was doing. I might have been working on a um, medical diagnosis robot uh, commercial contract. I was using these. They are very good, but as I say, they're quite expensive. But I might have a solution to that. Um, I don't know if that's the case yet, but anyhow, I'm going to try and make some boards. So the first tile I want to make is I want to put these on. So as I say, each one of these chips is capable of taking two input controls to drive one single motor. Um, so going back to our circuit here, our 12 IOs will go into these and then those will drive, for example, the, uh, hold on, let me get rid of the browser because you won't be able to see this. I'll just quickly show you. I won't do them all. I'll show you one so that you know where we're going here. Um, there we go. So if we take one of these, let's take that one. So what we'll have here is two inputs from say F FPGA1 and FPGA2. And we we'll say uh, motor in uh, to do to do zero, I think. Or we could use A and B. What do they use? They use one. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid because I'm using I. I don't want to use the numbers. It's going to be confusion. So let's say uh, A. And let's do the same for here. Mm -hmm. So those would be the only two bit inputs that we require for that, and that would go to uh, which is number one here. Is that number one? Mm -hmm. This one here. And then the outputs, let me just move this out of the way. Let's use one of these. I'll talk about these connectors in a minute because this was a bit of a pain actually. Hmm. Oh yeah, typical. Hold on. Completely ran the wrong way, of course. I'm only roughing this out at this point. It's probably going to be like that, I wouldn't wonder. And it's fairly easy to do this, you know, routing wise.
Okay, you get the picture. So it's really easy to root these as well. And they're very simple. So on this tile, I'm driving um, six motors. Um, the other thing you could do is you can drive steppers with this as well, Laurie because um, you were asking about the numbers. So I could combine two of these to drive a stepper because the stepper has two coils. However, uh, getting anything other than half and quarter steps out of it would be difficult. Maybe possible by varying the V-Ref in real time. Haven't tried that. Uh, but we might use it to demonstrate the stepper stuff as well. The same board can drive steppers, certainly from all the other stuff that we're working on, so it's not a problem. So these are very simple. Um, let me just show you that. So that looks like that when it's rooted. Very easy to do. Um, so I'll add all the decoupling and stuff. One of the big problems I've had actually is um, what to do on the... Um, um on the pcb itself so if you look at the connectors here one of the issues i have is fitting everything in um historically i've used a lot of through hole components commonly available uh you know jelly bean parts you know like the molex connectors with a 2.54 you know 0 0.1 inch um <clears throat> type um, spacing those would look like these ones here see on the bottom there these but I'm trying to avoid putting any through hole parts on these dropping my wires everywhere now reason being um in fact there's one by itself this is a like a four pin one can't get it to focus Might be a bit too close. Yeah. Um, trouble is that's through hole. Then our legs sticking out, and I'm trying to avoid that because it makes my assembly process really difficult. And I'm going to be making those boards myself rather than getting a manufacturer to do it because the cost of um, getting those manufactured. Is quite high unless I make about 500 and I don't want to make 500 at once because that's just nuts it's okay to do that with the um, uh, the um, the black stack you know the uh, ECP 5 board but you don't want to be doing it with all the peripherals because uh, it can get expensive so I can get these made quite easily locally um, and do most of it myself. I've got all the reflow stuff I need to do those. I can knock those out quite quickly. But uh, that's only the case if I'm using SMD stuff. If I have to solder connections, you know, this is the nonsense that I've been putting up with, you know, when I do the black ice is soldering these. Um, and just to remind you, the soldered parts of this, and I have to do all of these by hand, is uh, 30 times 3, that's 90 plus, what, 26, 116 solder joints for each one of these. And it just kills me. I'm quite good at soldering, obviously, but <laughs> I can't be spending my life doing it. It's just too much hassle. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, 
on these newer designs, one of the key things is to avoid all the um, through hole stuff. So I don't have to do that, just so I can automate it. Uh, so that's quite important. But finding the right kind of connectors, I mean, these are very popular connectors that are used. Uh, I've got a set of different size ones here. These are the XA type connectors. Uh, these are the cabling type bits with the crimp pins. Uh, I don't know if you can see these. So these are the female versions of what you get on there. So there's a four pin. And these are 2.5 mil spaced. Uh, type stuff. So I've got a whole uh, selection of those different sizes. I, these, I use these commonly to connect up motors. So you need something simple like that. So what I will probably do um, is using... Uh, Crimping the cable is quite difficult. One of the best tools for these is this one. Uh, mythical. If you have a look, I think you can get these in Amazon or somewhere like that. Can you read that? How well that's coming through. Um, these work quite well when you need to put them together. But uh, And you've got a choice of different sizes and stuff which is good they're not too expensive but it is hard work doing the crimping um, so what I will do in this case so these ones that I'm using on this board are surface mount which is difficult to find uh, actually well you can get them but they're very bloody expensive quite frankly from certainly from the Western suppliers um, uh, but I found these ones from uh, from uh, Asian suppliers now and what I'm trying to arrange is not only will I get the surface mount connectors, but I'll get a load of pre-crimped cables. So they will be crimped at one end. Um, I don't have an example here. Crimped at one end that goes into this board. So that bit's done. And then the other end's bare, so you can just solder them directly onto the motors themselves. So it makes it nice and easy. Um, I don't know which motors we're going to use, but what, one of the tricks that I've seen, say if we use these small ones, if these prove powerful enough for what we want to do, uh, you can design a board that fits onto the back of this. You look. Yeah. And Mythical, you may know this, because if you look on... Damn it. Can you see the two prongs coming out? You'd normally have to solder to them, but you can actually make a PCB that these fit into, and then you can have a connector on there or a screw, screw terminal, whatever you want. Uh, actually, what is interesting, I wonder if I can do it. If you look, I think Pimeroni used this. Bear with me. You'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, let me just turn the browser back on and show you guys. So if you look here, let's have a look at that one. Can you see what they've got? They've actually got the board soldered onto the back here. And then two easier spaced headers. So it's another strategy that we can use at the other end. But anyhow, I intend supplying cables that at least have the connector part on the tire end so that you don't have to worry about crimping. The other end you'll have to solder or whatever on however we decide them. So I want to try and make that easier. Also, these are quite expensive. On Pi Moroni, I think we can get them. I can get a set. It's going to be a bit cheaper than that if we decide to go down this route and use these particular ones. There's a better picture here, actually. You can see what they've done. But I can get some of those PCBs made up. 
it's another idea to make things a bit easier. The other thing that you could do is because depends how much room you've got. You could even on a design like this put a sensor depending which way you're going to go on your sensor control. Um, you don't have to put a sensor on the motor for a lot of the robotic stuff because you can um, you can work by your actual movements rather than the uh, the motor rotation in some cases. Damn it! My notice my um. I'm gonna have to um. Bear me a sec. I'm just gonna tighten my um. Seat up. So I don't want to kill myself falling over backwards. I have done that on the screen before, not killed myself. Had my seat collapse backwards. I've got a couple of dodgy um, screws that come loose on this chair. I have to tighten them up every now and then to prevent me making a complete tit of myself and falling off the back of the chair. I bet Laurie's seen me do that before now. I do have quite a nice mic that's not a lava mic, that's like a desk mic. I may well use that in some cases in the future, but I need to set it up properly. Okay, so what was I talking about? Motors, yeah. So one of the reasons I've gone for um, these surface mount motors is... Um, so that, let me just turn that uh, hours off. Is to make it easier for the construction. I've still got some fiddling to do to make these all fit in. It's a bit tight fitting all of those in. But that effectively gives us up to six degrees of freedom on each tile. And don't forget, on something like the black stack, we could actually have four of these boards. So we'd have four times six motors if we need it. I don't expect for one minute we're gonna need all that. The other thing that we could do is we could add some servo headers in on this board. So all of these pieces here, um, I could put uh, servo headers so that when you're not using them to drive motors, you could use them to double up to drive servos, for example. Um, in that case, what we'd be doing is we'd have something like this. Hold on, let me... Um, Add that in, you'll see what I mean. Uh, add. Do, 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 do. Headers. What do I want? I want. Um, so I could do a two by three. Two by three. Something like that. One here. See what I mean in a sec, folks. It's a bit tight, but I could probably do it. Um, and I'd probably use surface mount ones rather than these.
if I were to use these, oh, I've got these the wrong way around. Hold on. Improve my resolution here. Thus, and normally what you'd have on here, so that would be um, on these pins, what you get, so you've got your signals on the top and then you have your power. You know zero volt and power on these two pins so each one of those going down is for an individual servo motor um, so basically your header your free pin header literally fits over here and then another one fits on this side over this one And the advantage of doing that is you, you get a free servo header as well. So each one of these boards would then be capable of uh, driving up to 12 servos, depending whether you're using this motor channel or not. So if you're not using the motor channel, um, you know, each motor channel for a brush motor is the equivalent of two servo channels. So for any motor channel you're not using, you have two servo channels available. Or vice versa if you're doing it the other way around. So that might be a useful function to have in. I don't think I've got a surface mount version of that, but you, that will give you the um, right here. I don't think I've got the um, surface mount version. I'll leave it on there like that. I can fix that. So it's entirely possible to do that. So it means that this this generic, if you like, motor driver board is capable of. Oh, damn it! I need to. All oh, right, let's do it individually. I need to adjust these. So this single motor tile, motor control tile. Is capable of driving 12 servos, six brushed motors, or three steppered motors. Although it's probably not the most effective thing for stepper motors. Uh, if you want, you know, 16 steps or eight steps or 16 steps, something or above, then you're probably better off using, you know, I've already designed a um, stepper motor driver anyhow. Uh, which was a four axis stepper driver tile. But you know, it gives us some uh, flexibility in the design. New Where did you bring in that box, the wine box thing? In the car? Uh, it's still in the car suite. 
I can go and get it later if you want. You don't need it now, do you? No, I was just wondering where it was. Don't worry, I'll get it later. Um, so, I think the board is quite good as a as a start for the um, for robotics like projects, if you like. So the other thing that we'd need to think about adding on this board is some kind of DAC. I don't know if I've got one in the library that has enough channels. Let me have a quick look. Anyone else have a think about what else we need on this board? Start thinking about the things that we might want to add for feedback. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I should have any think about that. Let's have a look on here because why is that still showing headers? I do have some DAX on here. Go with me. I've left my salad out, but it's still hot. So can you put it away in like an hour or two? Yeah, no problem, sweet. I'm going to bed. Okay, right, see ya. Uh, oh, what's that one? Nothing of a good. Those are single decks. Hmm. Or my ABC. There is one other thing that we could use, which is a pot, digital pot, but they're not very fast. We want to vary the signal. Might not be the best way of doing it. I squared C. Uh, hold on. So some of the other inputs, so we've got four ADC inputs there, but don't forget the ADC inputs have multifunction. They're not just ADC in, they can be digital in or out as well on the microcontroller. So those might be good for um, inputs. Um, what would we use inputs for? Well, there's any number of different things, but the most obvious things that you might think of for raw gpio inputs um, you wouldn't necessarily want the fpga to do this because it's a very slow thing but you might want um, edge detection bumper type detection on the uh, robot to detect when it actually runs into something an obstacle or the edge of the room or something like that that could be useful so those four ADC pins that we've got there could be used to do bumper type detection. Um, there's also quite a few different versions of um, uh, object detection. Let me show you. Uh, there's an ultrasonic um, technique we could use. Um, something like, oh look, they've got a smiley face on this. Let me just turn their browser on so you can see this. So I'm just looking at Pi Moroni, they've got some. Uh, so you can pick these units up quite easily. I'm just trying to remember what the IOs on this. So you send a pulse out one side and then you receive it back on the other but I can't remember whether it's analog single ping three volt free sensor breakout so ping and the echo are the same pin oh what really so reverse very sonic distance center support very pi to Breakouts fully compatible with the breakout cards. You can plug in one of the I2C connectors and use it on GPIO pin 4. It's a single link transparency. So the ping and the echo are on the same pin. 
Well, that's a bit odd. I wouldn't normally do it that way. You'd normally use two, one to trigger it and one to see when you get the pulse back. But what you can do is you can turn the GPIO around from writing to reading and measure the time between. Um, if you're doing the distance sensing, though, that might be better to have that done in the FPGA because it can work that out more easily and it's less intensity, intensive. Uh, low level activity, i.e., taking away cycles from the um, microcontroller. Um, the other way of doing it is um, using time of flight type devices. I think Sharp have some good ones. Uh, I wonder if they've got anything on here. Yeah, so you see, they're using one here. This is the VLX, sorry, VL6180X. So these are a bit more reliable than the ultrasonic sensors, in my experience. Probably better to use, but they are more expensive in some ways. So what's this? It's 1290. So it's uh, an AD. 3316. So this one's made by Adafruit. And what is it? I squared C or hold on, let's have a look. Stem QT connectors. Now which stem QT? Is it the I squared C one or is it the GPIO one? Uh, it's I squared C, so that's nice and easy. Don't forget we've got I squared C on the tiles as well. So I'm not sure if that's something that we want to actually put on the tile. We will have QT or stemmer connectors on the um the main um, black stack, the amalgam board itself. It's probably better to hang those off because the tile proximity is not necessarily going to correspond to where we want those pointing. Um, but this is one way that we can, you know, do the um, time of flight type location, uh, distance sense sensing of any obstructions and stuff which is quite nice and then you fall back on the bumper type stuff um, yeah Laurie says he's used the flight time of flight sensors on black sock so he's already got some better dog to that that's cool um uh, to a degree, you can you could do that in the FPGA, you could do that on the microcontroller. It's not going to take huge amounts because this will work out a lot of the details for you. Um, what was I looking for? Um, I was looking for some DAX. Hold on, bear with me, folks. I might have to go and look for this separately. Yeah, I can't find it. I need to find the part number and I can't remember for the life of me what it was. Um, pretty sure it was... Uh, I, I know there are I squared C ones, but I wanted a spy multi-channel deck. I may have to go and have a look on um, Bowser for that. Uh, 
There is a large choice. So if we went for say a six channel, so we had a channel for each of the motor drivers to control the VREF, the current sense, or we could control every two if we wanted. Say we went for six, there's probably not many of those. What have we got here? Uh, Oh, I thought I just selected that. Rome. Oh, Rome. Whatever you want to call them. It's only an 8-bit. Eight 8-bit eight would probably be enough. Though. These don't need to be particularly accurate, but they do need to be... It would be nice if they were faster. Does it give the frequency? Free wire serial, that's good. Um, this is OP14. It doesn't talk about the frequency. Those are rather expensive, in my opinion, but hold on. Probably because we're choosing an odd number like six, we might be able to find an eight bit for a similar price. Well, what's it saying? Eight bit, four channel, six channel type. Uh, settling time, data transfer, 10 megahertz. 100 microseconds, so that's not particularly fast. Mm. But they're simple enough. And yeah, we could just use SPI to control these. Very easy to do. So that's a possible candidate. What happens if we just um, choose eight? Do we get a few more to choose from? That's probably a better number. Yeah, there you go. So if we had 8 bit DAC, settling time 10 microseconds, so it's a lot faster. WQF16. That kind of thing might do it. And they are, you know, if you buy 100 of those, they're only 87 pence. So they're significantly cheaper than the other ones. Um, and these are I squared C. And they can actually go to the 10-bit as well, which is interesting. Not familiar with these ones. Maybe these are newer ones. Yeah, I'm not sure about using I squared C. I wanted to use SPI really. Trouble is with the um, I squared C is it's easy to overload the I squared C address wise. I don't know what address choices we have on here. Uh, Normally with Texas Instruments, they have something really complicated. Uh, address point. Slave address. Yeah, by you, by tying certain pins up or down or whatever, you can actually set the address to quite a range. Yeah, 
Yeah, so something like that might do. I'll keep this one open because that's useful. What's the difference between these? 8 bit. Oh, that goes up to 16. Is it the same? Oh, no, that's much larger. Yeah, it's massive. That's like a 40 pin QFN. Overkill. Look at the price change. You go from, you know, a 77 cents, 77 pence chip up to a 17 pound chip. It's just search by price. It's madness. Ish madness. What's going on? There's some others here. There's another run one. I think the TI one would probably be best. Okay. Um, so just switching back. Sorry, guys, I've gotten carried away with that. The other thing I need to think about is where we put connectors on here. Um, whether we should bother with anything. So we have the ADC, which either uses the SPI or I squared C. I'm just looking to see um, if any of the Texas ones use SPI. There's a Maxim one as well, uses SPI. But the i squared ones are much cheaper. So we'd have the DAC on the board here. We'd have the servo headers here. And as I said, I'd need to do those with um, surface mount versions of these headers, not through holes. So I don't want to be soldering those things. Unless I made it an optional thing and including them in the pack and you could solder them if you like. Maybe. Maybe. Um, so we need a DAC on there. Then we need a whole bunch of caps, which I have. Uh, what else might we do? So what pins? haven't we used we haven't used well the spy potentially we've got the four analog plus the interrupt which we could use and I don't want those to go to waste so I probably need to add some sort of header pin here or something um, like for example let's just put it in so i don't forget we can use these as general purpose ios which would be useful for bumper type detection and stuff so i put something like a uh, like this which could also have i squared c on it if we needed maybe Could possibly go here. Um, might be a squeeze it in the side there. Another possibility. Although that makes it slightly crowded. Do I have a surface mount version of that? Hold on. Anything else you guys think we would want to put on here, given the pins that we have left? Could be useful. Hmm. 
Perhaps that's a long way header. Maybe. Something like that, perhaps. That would be the um, IO. Uh, sense input. Uh, it's sometimes useful to have analog as well. Um, so, for example, um, quadrature rotation sensor headers could be useful. Good point, Laurie. Let me come back to that. Uh, are you planning on doing to doing brick detection with cameras? Yes, uh, simple light color detectors can be useful. Well, blob detection is quite easy. So that's a consecutive area of similar color within a fresh hop. That's kind of blob detection. Uh, and for something like Lego, that will work quite well. Ideally, what you do is you do a blob detection first. That will give you the window of interest then you could use machine learning to do the final selection as whether that's Lego or not. Um, and by that time, you've also got the video pixels down to a reasonable size that you could run some basic ML um, classification. It's easier to train on Lego because you've got lots of bricks. Um, so yeah, quadrature, quadrature. We could use these pins. It's best to do quadrature detection on the FPGA where possible. Uh, it's easy to do it. It's easy to do the HDL for quadrature. You don't want the microcontroller doing that. So this header is really for the uh, microcontroller stuff. The reason you might want the analog stuff is for light sensors and stuff. So you might want the robot to follow towards light. That's quite a good exercise. The other thing that you can do, so if you want your robot to home, one of the tricks that you can do is you can use uh, an infrared source on the charging station. And then have a couple of uh, IR sensors, analog IR sensors, on the uh, on on the robot itself, you know, with some distance between them to be able to do, you know, not triangulation, but you know, like a crude form for finding home, um, or at least getting in the vicinity of home. So those inputs are kind of useful as generic inputs. It's difficult to know exactly how you're going to use them, so it's best just to pin them out and then we can use those. For the quadrature stuff then, we don't have enough GPIO pins left that aren't already dedicated to either motor slash servo functions. I mean, we could reduce the number of motor channels on there and have a certain number of encoders. Uh, to do quadrature encoders, again, you need the same number of lines as you do as a brushless control, i.e. Two, two lines. So if you wanted to have quadrature control in proportion to the number of motors, you'd only have three motors on here and then use three pairs of pins to do quadrature control. Uh, the issue with doing that is um, it could be wasteful. Should you decide in up ahead that you're going to use quadrature encoding and quadrature decoding as your motion tracking? Um, there are other choices now. Uh, is, it, um, is it Austrian Micro? They do quite a few magnetic encodings with encoder chips, which are really nice and can be placed on a PCB. Then a neodymium magnet is actually put on the shaft of the motor or on the wheel itself, for example. Um, 
if you were looking at a wheel. Um, and those can work over SPI or I squared C. So we have some choices there. The other thing that you can do is you can put optically encoded uh, patterns on the inside of the wheel and track those as they go past. Those kind of use a gray code. Uh, that can then just go into simple optical trans uh, optical um, either a vein slot thing where it, where you're looking for a hole in the um, in the wheel as it goes past, or through reflection by firing it at the wheel, which is already encoded with the right patterns, and seeing if you get a reflection or not. That's another possibility. Um, but sometimes it doesn't always tell you what you want. So, for example, if you've got a robot that's moving, your wheel could be going round, but you may not actually be moving because your wheel could be skidding, for example. Um, so what you might do is have a third wheel that is a passive wheel that moves when the robot moves. And you may use that for doing your things like calculating how far you've traveled, your ready reckoning type algorithms, if you're employing them. Um, an accelerometer is sometimes useful as well. So are we actually moving? So things are telling us that we should be moving, our motors are moving, but are we actually seeing the acceleration and deceleration that we should do with the motor so you can determine whether maybe you're skidding or not getting the traction that you should be or whether you're stuck that kind of thing so there are lots of different ways of determining how you do that and the actual motor position might not be important really it can be because it's not about the absolute positioning of the motors in many cases sometimes you just need to know is the wheel turning but you might not need to know much detail about that uh, you can also do things like stall current detection but these chips do not support that not easily um, you can try changing the current settings on the motor and there might be a scheme that can give you some clues by doing that. But yeah, maybe, you know, by looking at the information presented by, say, an accelerometer and the feedback you're getting from like the passive motion control wheel, for example, distance, you know, travel cent center or reckoning or the distance. Uh, if you're using the time of flight center and you're heading towards an object and you're getting readings off that, then if you're moving, the distance between you and that object should change. So it's another way of what you can do is you can pile all the various different pieces of information you've got to work out exactly what situation you're in and therefore what strategy you should be applying. You know, am I stuck? Are my wheels just spinning? Am I moving? Am I getting closer to? where I planned on getting to, for example. Um, that may not be useful, time of flight may not be useful when you're trying to get to a piece of Lego on the floor because that's going to be below the level of where your time of flight sensor is going to be, you know, uh, measuring because that's going to be up higher looking for what you know obstructions slightly higher than the lego bricks in some cases it will hit in other cases it won't in which case you may have to back up and actually use information from the vision processing and distance reckoning that kind of thing could use the servo headers for it yeah so if you're not using a motor then you could use that as a quadrature input. Let me just double check the data sheet. Um, make sure it's not doing anything odd.
Um, let me get rid of some of these. Um, got a lot of windows, a lot of tabs open again. Forum, no, we don't need that. Before 50 search. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, data sheet because it will tell us how those internal uh, lines are um, set up to make sure that we are safe with that. I think we will be, but let's just double check. Um, we don't need to worry about the outputs because they're going to be open if there's no motor connected anyhow. Um, I can't find my browser. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Right, logic input current. Yeah, it's tiny amounts. So it's got a high impedance input. Oh, I and mean, it's got a logic input pull down resistance, look. But it's 50 kilo ohms, so that's not going to interfere with us. But we do need to be aware that that is a, um, a pull down uh, rather than a pull up. So as long as we take that into account, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, that pull down is there for safety because if both are zero, particularly for a period of time, it actually um, powers down sections of the motor driver. So yeah, we should be fine on that. Near prob. Gyro, yes, good point. Uh, Laurie. I wouldn't put those, I'm not sure I'd put those on this board. That might be better on a separate board. Uh, I need to have a think. Do we want that on this board? Mm. The accelerometer. Or would that go on another board? Don't forget, on something like the... Um, the black stack, the uh, amalgam, we've got four tiles, potentially. So we've got loads of room for expansion. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter where the accelerometer is. So it could go on one of these boards. Um, likewise with the gyro. They tend to be O squared C devices, right? Hold on. Mm. What do we want? Free access? I'm really interested in two, but yeah, may as well. Uh, I don't know what, how many grams, you know sensitivity we need no idea but we do want them digital let's do digital and digital spi i guess so do they vary from and to nowadays see so they can be had very low cost Memsic, I don't know them. Um, so what's that? That's a uh, I squared C device. It's very little, really. Accelerometer, high resolution, ten pin. Do you get uh, accelerometers with gyros built in? Is that common? Ross tends to use quadrature and IMU and laser sensors. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid the laser stuff because it's expensive. Things like LiDAR is just makes things really expensive. Not only that, but you just end up with a point cloud. And processing point clouds and dealing with voxels is just it's like you know we're really at kind of level four or five and that's up at like 55 if you're not careful and it just eats up cycles 
Um, yeah, there's quite a few here to choose from. I don't know if you can get them that have gyros and accelerometers in the same chip or whether you, the normal thing is to use two different chips for that. All sorts here, lots of choices. But most of them seem to be I squared C, I think. Well, in fact, look, I squared C or SPI. Many of them. I'd probably use SPI simply because I've got the SPI connection there. So it could be worth putting that on this board to use the SPI. Definitely. What about gyros? Oh, why is it giving me? No, I don't know. Those are really expensive. Wow. This one's a bit lower cost. An ST device. DPS, what's DPS? Dot per square centimeter, is that on there? Two axis, three axis. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's a bit more expensive. What did you say, IMUs? What does the IMU stand for? IMU, IMU, IMU. Uh, inertial measurement units, there you go. So is that the combination of the two things? Okay, thanks Mythical, uh, have fun. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some uh, HTL code next time. Thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, I am you, Laurie. Uh, are they a combination? Well, world's first seven accesses integrated solution. So it's a gyro accelerator and pressure. Do you need the pressure sensor? Or is that for when you're putting them in drones or something? Wow. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Single chip solution. But blimey, they are not cheap. So what is this one here? So this is six axis, nine axis. What is this Bosch SensorTech? Interesting. It's digital. Mm. So it does I2C and SPY. LGA 14. LGA. Is that like... um? like a BGA of some sort. There's a TDK one here as well. Similar pricing. Those are um, well Adafruit has something here, the LS LSM six. Uh, that's interesting. So actually the Adafruit board looks cheaper. That's a six axis. Everyone's a nine axis. Let's just get a data sheet of this. I'm intrigued. Bosch. Android Lollipop compatible. That's clearly important if you want to sell a volume of these, I guess. One thing is uh, extended I squared C mobile frequencies up to one megahertz. Okay. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, 
normal supply range because they're like a block diagram here we go yeah SPIOI squared C yeah that kind of thing might do it BM 160 we could put that on a board maybe it's a nice looking thing functions normal mode accelerometer gyroscope and magnetometer oh external magnetometer What does it mean by external? Does that mean that you need another chip to do the magnetometer? So this is an accelerometer and gyroscope, but not a magnometer, mag, magnetometer, magnetometer. Is that right? Hmm. Hold on. What was the um, Adafruit one? Is, uh, this is on a um, on a stemmer breakout. If it's stemmer defects and it's on a new board, allows the user to add motion and orientation systems for Arduino product. The board includes an STM LSM6033. Six degrees of freedom, IMU, accelerometer and gyroscope. Free axis accelerometer. Free axis gyroscope. Yeah, I mean, we could even use those to start with. Is it on the list? BM160. So the chip they're using on the Adafruit board is this one. Why is that LC? How annoying. What have they replaced it with, I wonder? Oh, they're really reasonably priced too. There'll also be Arduino drivers, which are quite good for testing out first. Hmm. So yeah, it might be worth putting this on the chip. It's not on the chip on the tile I'm going to put a note in here in fact uh, is it this one what is this what package is this what's the difference between these two Um, bear with me just a sec. I'm just going to put this package in. Uh, God, I can't remember what this bloody thing is that we use. So, uh, it's a Mac. 
Hearts. Library loader. Here we go. Download folder. Browse. Right. I may have just had a dropout. Um, let me just update um, Mantec Driver. So if I can add this in, save me doing it later. What was it? LSM, this one. So, SCI, SDA, SDO, CS. Yeah, so we kind of have to do that. Actually, it's quite small. It's small and we I can go in here. Tiny look. Let me give it a browser, you'll see. Wee little thing look here. It's like a sixteen pin. Is it a QFM? What do they call it? Package. LGA 16, free mil by free mil. A tad fiddly, but yeah, so I think it shouldn't be a problem. For this wee tiny thing. Okay, that's on there as well, so I need to wire that in. And I'll probably connect that over SPI. Um, in fact, I can probably, I can probably sit right next to this, where the connectors are. Because these connectors are on the bottom, don't forget. It's blue stuff. Right. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up today. Unfortunately, we haven't had any time to do any my gem, but we can do some more next week. Anything else you wanted to add on this uh, lorry, on this board? Um, if there is anything else, obviously, you can let me know, mate, on the forum, etc. Let me just save this for so I remember. Um, so we're going to use the spy for the IMU. It uses those pins up. We've got I squared C as well. So I'm going to need the DAC for that. Oh dear. Can't remember which one we had now. Let's go back. Quick look through my history. Um, we were interested in the TI one. This one looked good. Guess. Hold on. If 
I can add that in whilst I remember before I go. Um, I should really do that every time, it's very annoying. What's the part number? DAC for free. For free, for free. Oh, wait. Might need to clean up these symbols as well. Those auto generated ones are a bit rubbish. That can go on the I squared C. That's our DAC. Uh, it also means we've got two, um, I want it kind of mid, mid center really. Um, if I have it here actually, then I can take it under this lot because we're going to have the servo blocks here. Um, so that's the DAC. Uh, what else was I going to put on there? We're missing something, aren't we? Bugger if I can remember what it was. So if you use the I squared C for the DAX, we're using SPI for the IMU. Um, need to replace the header, servo headers with um, SMD versions. I, I think that's going to have to go down here as well, by the way. Thinking about it. By the time I put these here, the pins of these are much wider on the surface mount. They're going to jut into that, make it difficult. I'll have those there. Um, that shouldn't be a problem. Are we missing anything else on this board? I mean, don't forget we'll have other tiles as well. Just want to cover our bases, really. Anyhow, um, thanks for joining us, everyone. Much appreciated. Um, as I say, we do some more um, MIGEN next week on the stepper stuff. Um, but I've also got to get these boards off order, um, ordered swiftly. So I need to, I will order this board so we can actually start working with the motors first thing in the new year because I won't get this until January now by the time I've rooted it and got it off. Um, but that should correspond, hopefully. Maybe I can get the uh, Black Ice 5 uh, carrier board for um, the ice core. Get both of those at the same time, that would be nice. But thank you, friends. I will speak to you soon. Should be Wednesday as normal next week. Um, it's two days before Christmas, isn't it? So it's the day before Christmas Eve. So I'll probably do a stream as well. Let me see how I get on. Hopefully I can squeeze one in. If you're around and interested, let me know. Remember that uh, we're all down at the forum at MyStorm as well. If you want to join in the conversation in the interim period, um, come and join us. Um, but for now, thank you. Oh, I post. Yes, you are in the correct chat area. I see my message appeared on the screen. <laughs> but you're a bit late. I post you. I was just closing off for this week. Um, I, I will put this up on iTube. So that'll be up sometime. Uh, sorry, on iTube. YouTube. <laughs> so I will have that. Uh, transcoded onto YouTube tomorrow as well so you can catch up there I post but you're in the right place if you want to see them live I, I normally kick off 8 p.m. GMT at the moment because we're in winter time uh, UK time uh, if you want to join us live but yeah you're in the right place you're in Florida right okay Radio.
Thanks, guys. I'm signing off now because I'm tired. I've had enough. <laughs> um, enjoy it when you uh, see the transcoded version on YouTube later I post. And maybe we'll see you next week if you can get here earlier. Depends if you're working or whatever. Um, but thanks, everyone, for joining us. Interesting Fred. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Ciao.